This is day 16 of reading Revelation. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth became illumined by his splendor. He cried out in a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a haunt for demons. She is a cage for every unclean spirit, a cage for every unclean bird, a cage for every unclean and disgusting beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of her licentious passion. The kings of the earth had intercourse with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her drive for luxury. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Depart from her, my people, so as not to take part in her sins and receive a share in her plagues. For her sins are piled up to the sky, and God remembers her crimes. Pay her back as she has paid others. Pay her back double for her deeds. Into her cup pour double what she poured. To the measure of her boasting and wantonness, repay her in torment and grief. For she said to herself, I sit enthroned as queen. I am no widow, and I will never know grief. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, pestilence, grief, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. The kings of the earth who had intercourse with her in their wantonness will weep and mourn over her when they see the smoke of her pyre. They will keep their distance for fear of the torment inflicted on her, and they will say, Alas, alas, great city, Babylon, mighty city, in one hour your judgment has come. Today we hear the beginning of chapter 18, which is the main critique of economic injustice that is sort of the centerpiece of Revelation. We hear about the judgment of Babylon, and here I will remind you that what we're talking about here is more an idea than any particular system or any particular state or any particular historical thing that is or ever was or that ever will be. Babylon is present in some form in all of our thinking and in the, the ocean, the economic ocean that we all swim in. It's interesting to note that kings and merchants are described as being involved in this. Here we have economics and politics coming together and the way that many of us recognize in the world that economics and politics tend to get mixed up with each other, with that money seems to have a way of corrupting so many things. There's a key phrase in this, the, the drive for luxury. And I would point out to you that luxury, defined technically, and certainly from its origins, means excess or extravagance. It isn't simply great comfort, but somehow it's more than is needed. It's not simply enough. And so whenever we are thinking about the things we've been talking about in, in terms of God's economy, abundance and what is sufficient. We're not talking here about the need to have more and more and more, but rather simply the need to have enough. And so by that definition, many more of us have abundance than we might otherwise imagine, because many of us have enough, even if at times in our weak moments, perhaps we would like to have more. This metaphor of drunkenness with money is pretty easy to understand. It isn't hard to remember some time in our lives when suddenly we had a windfall of money and were totally taken with all of the possible uses for it, for the power it might give us, for the, the worldly benefit it might give us. So it's not difficult to imagine that in this case, Babylon is partly the way that each one of us responds to wealth and to the goods of this world that come to us, how we understand them, whether we understand them to be our property or rather as something from God for the use of God's kingdom. However, as we can see, what is being described here is more like a cage than a luxury hotel. This is what ultimately limits us, our way of imagining the way that value is made in the world, that each of us is valuable only because of what we have or what we're able to spend. It becomes what, what binds us, what keeps us from going where we would desire to go. 
It was a very useful metaphor, I think, that Babylon, having fallen from its luxurious heights, is now described as a prison that people are trapped in. We're told that the faithful are supposed to depart from Babylon. That's a little bit complicated because how do you do that if what we're talking about here is an idea rather than a place? It's easy enough to imagine moving away from something, some place where something terrible is happening. But I think what it's calling us to think about is what non-Babylonian economics might look like, what it might mean to run the household of God, whether it's our individual households as faithful people or the church, in a way that is acknowledges that the world is out there and that the world does things the way the world does it, but that places value on different things that values in a different way. It's worth considering every time the church makes a decision about how to spend its resources, whether it is acting in a Babylonian manner or in some other way that perhaps is closer to God's economy where grace is the principal uh, currency. In the end, we should see that this is ultimately the only way that has any hope. By the end of this lesson, everyone has deserted Babylon, even her erstwhile allies, even the kings and the merchants and wealthy people and powerful people have fled when that system can no longer provide them what they need, when its flaws and its inner rottenness are finally exposed. Oh, <laughs>